How are your bums on the notes? Unfortunately, now I have to podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Truly, you suffer for content. The logistic map. Uh huh. That's right. Good. I'm, I'm having a major like arthritis flare up at the moment, so everything is a bit sore. So if I'm a bit grumpy, dear listener, that's why. And hello to you, in fact, dear listener. Welcome to this bonus episode of statistically significant insignificant. I was trying to say. <laughs> Don't let it cut it. Don't let her cut it. Continue talking so she has to keep up the continuity. (laughs) Oh, I can cut whatever I like. That's the power of being the editor. Uh. I was trying to say logistically insignificant to be a a joke, but fumbled it. (laughs) Dear listener, please go back in your mind palace and just edit out the bit where I stumbled over that. It it is, however, a bonus episode. Thank you for your money. And today we're going to talk about basically the first kind of mathematical object that I came across that had weird and interesting behavior. This is, I guess, a continuation on the idea of whimsy from last week. So this is a a slightly whimsical one on my behalf. The logistic map is... Oh, it's a thing. Like Like it's a magic item. Yes, basically. All right. Yeah, yeah. The cat is trying to walk on my... I will take him away. Thank you. This is not going to stay <laughs> in a way. So the logistic map is a, a function. So it's a thing that takes an input and gives an output that describes a dynamic system, a system that evolves over time. We're looking at change in discrete time. So you can think of turns or like one year to the next because it does get used to model behavior and like in ecology and things. And we basically repeatedly apply the same function, the logistic map, to a number and see how that number behaves. I don't think we should be modeling behavior for ecology. I think it should make its own decisions. <laughs> well, see, the thing is, uh, ecology does make its own decisions, and then we cry about the fact that none of our models work. <laughs> so the logistic function gives the value of this system at time x n plus 1. Oh. <laughs> it's equal to r, which we call the reproduction rate, which we'll talk about in a second, times the value at time xn times 1 minus the value at time xn. Oh, come on. <laughs> oh, God, it's one of these. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. You know, get- talking about the reproductive function and looking at this reminds me about how um, two of the people in my year would, well, rather, one of the guys in a year and his girlfriend, although I suppose... Maybe it's better to frame her as the active participant. She would just give him hand jobs at the back of the math class. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> anyway, and that's what this reminds me of. Is when <laughs> so so the reason that you never learned any maths in high school is you were too, dra- too distracted by the guy getting jacked off in the background. I only found this out afterwards. <laughs> the reason I learned any mathematics at, in high school was... Because um, you were jacking off in another room. <laughs> no. I was jacking <laughs> off in my mind palace. See, I went to an all-boys school for the last four years of my education, and I distinctly remember remember someone playing porn in like a distractingly front row seat (laughs) that is the difference i guess that's a power move to be looking at porn in the front seat not that anyone wouldn't have liked to have given each other hand jobs but that would have led to severe bullying in that context yes i can imagine (laughs) when i worked in a uh internet cafe in western australia there was this one guy older guy who came around on a regular basis to go on dating websites it was very sad to be perfectly honest he would just sit there scrolling through these dating sites and then one day i guess he got fed up with the dating sites and decided to hop on porn instead (laughs) (laughs) except this is in an internet cafe and the computer he was at had a screen facing where i sat behind the counter (laughs) so i just looked over it's like the fucking guy's looking at porn. <laughs> and, um, well, okay, I, I didn't explicitly. The, the manager who was hanging out and talking to me at the time looked over and said, oh my god, I think he's looking at porn. And she was just kind of frozen in shock and I went, fuck's sake, walked in and told him he had to leave. But it's like, if you're going to do that, don't pick a computer that I can fucking see. Yeah. <laughs> Be a little subtle. I honestly think that that guy was doing it not to get horny in the front row of a class. It was to, like own the teacher in some abstract way yeah look that wouldn't surprise me i mean (laughs) students harassing teachers actually does happen yeah yeah but yeah so this week we're talking about the logistic function which has a reproduction rate in it unrelated (laughs) to people jacking off in maths classes for us r the reproduction rate is going to be some number between zero and four if it's zero we're not actually going to worry about that but you get zero every time anyway if that's the symbol for the british pound you've just written there what is that Oh, that's that's the mathematical symbol is a member of or in. 
So R is in the interval 0, 4. So it's a 0, or 1, or 2, or 3, or 4? Or any number in between. Uh, we, we don't recognise. The useful line does not recognise. Well, we are outside the useful line here. Oh, right. Listener, um, I'm depressed today. So when, when we said that we were going to do a bit more whimsy, I was like excited. But now my brain is completely broken. <laughs> <laughs> re- but we probably shouldn't like always be talking down the podcast and its content, but this is kind of psychic violence to us. Can I also point out another piece of psychic violence, which is you put a square bracket. Yes, on uh, one end and a round bracket on the round other. Round bracket on the other. That has meaning. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. So the square bracket means that zero is an included number and the round bracket means that four is an excluded number. Oh, so you can have 3.9 repeating. But- well, no, if it goes on forever, that is four. 3.9 to some number of finite decimal places, yes. Yes. So basically, four doesn't count, 3.999, but terminates does. And for our purposes, x is going to be some number between zero and one. If it is zero, then you get zero here, and it multiplies out, you just get zero every time. If it's one, you get zero here, and you get zero every time. So they they don't have very interesting dynamical behavior, but they are... What's the n that tells you which turn you're in so if n is equal to one that's the first turn and this is the second turn right so the second turn is equal to this combination of the first turn and r all of this nonsense yes all of this nonsense okay r and r is what r is what we call the reproduction rate it governs the behavior long-term behavior of this system right okay we will see what R does. And different values of R produce wildly different behaviour. And X is... Sorry, I realise you said all this. X is just some number between 0 and 1. Why is it... No, it has to be something. What we're going to see is that X changes over time governed by this, and what it does long term depends on R. So hang on. This is not for a specific purpose. This is whimsy. Yeah. All right. (laughs) We're going to look at some examples. This is whimsy. All right. Listen, I hope my asking Tess to repeat things was useful to you as it was to me. <laughs> Let's have a look at some examples. I'm going to keep this bit because it's useful. No, I need all of it. All right. <laughs> Come on, Dean. <laughs> you don't have to make our lives oh, harder here. I just, I need to know what R and X are. No, it, it, that's fine. We can could, we could work with this. <laughs> all right. So we are going to start a bunch of examples. We're going to have our first. Can I talk? T- Oh, I've got some calculations here that I did ahead of time that I'm not doing on the fly. <sighs> so, no. All right, so we're going to start our examples. I've a podcast with Lenty, go co-host. I don't think that's true. We are, unfortunately. She, we're not a better podcast. She just shot me the filthiest fucking look. <laughs> <laughs> so, we're going to start our population at time zero or turn zero with the number X being 0.5. We call this the initial condition. You do. Yep. That was, uh, sorry, exclusive we, to be we, the mathematicians, as right. opposed to you, the non-mathematicians. The royal we. Mm-hmm. So let's have a look for r is equal to zero. I already said that this goes to zero, but let's indicate that. So we have x, zero, is equal to 0.5. x, one, is equal to zero for r times 0.5 times one minus 0.5. Because there's a zero in it, that's going to be zero. This joke's a little late, but the phrase the royal we has lost a lot of its glamour since all of the news about Prince Andrew came out. <laughs> I mean, if you had glamour for the royal family in the first place, that's on you. Bootlickers. <laughs> I said, look, it Ma- had a gravitas to it. Now it, it just has an ass to it. <laughs> Next, we're going to look at R is equal to 0.8. So again, X0 is 0.5. X1 is going to be 0.8 for the reproduction number times 0.5 times 1 minus 0.5, which is 0.2. We take this and we put it back in. So the second term is going to be 0.8 because R is constant times... What's up? Okay, so this is turn 0. Turn 0 is this one. Okay, and R here is the reproductive rate. Yes. So 0.8... There, 0.8 there, 0.8 there. So why? where does 0.5 come from? That is previous turn's value. But that's... How could turn 0 not be the previous turn? Because this is turn 1. Okay, so if you times 0.5 by 0 times 8. Times 1 minus 0.5. Right. That gives you 0.2. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
this is 0 0.5, this is also 0 0.5, and this is 0 0.8, right? So... Yeah, no, I'm following, I'm following. Our initial condition is 0 0.5. Yep, and then on turn one, we go from 0 0.5 to 0 0.2. By applying the reproductive. By applying the function, all of this, all of this is the function. Yes, okay, now I get you. Yep. And this is turn two, where we take the 0 0.8 and now apply it to 0 0.2. Yes. So we get 0 0.2 there, 1 minus 0 0.2 here, which gives us 0 0.128. So it's shrinking. Yeah, but because it's it's multiplying it by one minus, there's kind of a little like a break. Yeah, so there there is a balancing act, but because all of these numbers are always going to be smaller than one, yeah, yeah, yeah. this is always going to shrink. So this asymptotes or the long term behavior of this is a decline to zero. I realize I'm rehashing stuff from that's, previous yeah, previous right. episodes of the podcast, but <laughs> just imagine just the world's sweatiest Germans. <laughs> Klaus, listen, I've I found a way to make a number slightly smaller every time. And then Klaus is dying of the fucking Black Plague and he goes, <clears throat> and he's so happy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Alright, carry on. The best part is doing this without a computer to do it for you. Oh, riveting. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be a downer. I just, I don't see the point. Does this visualize it to something fun? We will visualize it. I'm just showing you some examples so you can get an idea of what the behavior is. Okay, so we understand what's taking place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now we're going to look at r equal to 1.1. So this is no longer necessarily declining. Right. right. Because not all of those numbers are less than 1. Right. So again, x0 equals 0 0.5 x1 equal to 1.1 .1 times 0 0.5 times 1 minus 0 0.5 is equal to, got to look at my notes here, 0 0.275. Do it again, x2 turns out to be equal to 0 0.219. This also asymptotes, but not to 0. This now asymptotes to the number r minus 1 on r. It turns out to be that's the, the, the value based on r, which is... 0 0.1 on 1.1, which turns out to be 0 0.09. So you run this for long enough, it will go down to 0 0.09 and then stay there for the rest of eternity. Oh, okay. Yes. So this is kind of like the fucking 421 or whatever it was. Yeah, kind of. In the sense that what we have here is a system that's behavior is dependent on R. R is the literally the determining factor at the moment. As R changes, the long-term behavior of this system changes. How come you're using X as 0 0.5 every time? I don't have to. Regardless of the initial condition, this will asymptote to 0 0.09. Regardless of what X is? Regardless of what X0 is. For these, regardless of what X0 is, they will go to 0. The rate of decline is determined by R. So interest, okay, interesting. So the so it doesn't matter what your fucking X is. R is the R is the key. R is the actual, a, R yeah. is the determining factor in this. Yes. All right. Okay, I'm following. You say you're feeling slightly more whimsical, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> I, compared to how we began, I am infinitely more whimsical. So in that case, in these examples, it's always going to decline, but. Uh, where you start from is what's going to determine how, how far how long it, it takes declines. to get there. Yeah, yeah, right. X0 here could be 0 0.8. You would still wind up at 0 0.09 as what we call the steady state. Yeah. It would just take longer to get there because you're starting from a higher number. Yeah, right. Yeah. So our steady state is a recurring value. In this case, it is 0 0.09. So this function is a way of working out what R's collapse to given enough turn turns. Sorry, not R, what X's. Yeah, but we've, R's the key, so... what? Okay, so what R leads to what sort of behaviour long-term for X, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. R does not change. I feel like you, of all people, can't get mad about deciding, like, numbers over an unlimited amount of turns. Like, isn't that your whole vibe? <laughs> he only deals with finite numbers of turns. So. <laughs> uh, fair. Yeah, most buff spells only last for 10 turns, so... <laughs> Reasonable. Now, we ha let's have a look at R equal to 1.9. Same idea, X0 equals 0 0.5, X1 is equal to, where is it, 0 0.475. Notice this is declining slower. X2, sorry, X1 is equal to 0 0.475. X2 is equal to 0 0.4738. And in fact, the steady state for this is uh, 0 0.4738125. 
asymptotes pretty fast, but to a different value. If x is above 1... Yes, what happens? It still goes down? Well, if x is above 1, this will be a negative number. Right. So this and is... if we go back to the initial sheet, is... is This one? Yeah. 1 is a valid... Yeah, so if x is equal to 1, then this is 0. So you get 0. Right, okay. Likewise, if x is equal to 0, you stay at 0. Okay. So yeah, they yeah. are valid in that sense, but they just lead to 0. Right, okay, fair enough. Yeah. At yeah. the start, we we, out, we ruled out any fun numbers. <laughs> they can't go up. Okay, so what... But, but, but I really am trying to... You know, it's so fun. the X, no matter what the X is, that changes sort of the, the, the rate it behaves. But the, the R... Is the determining factor for the long-term behavior. So any yeah. given R always has the same steady state output. Yes, yeah, so the, for R 1.1... 1. 1, Whatever x is between 0 and 1, you will always long-term asymptote to 0 0.09, the steady state. Okay. Likewise, for r equal to 1.9, you will always eventually asymptote to this 0 0.47, whatever, whatever. Maybe I've just done enough, I work with computers too much, so my brain is just compartmentalized all of the actual calculation you're doing as a box yeah. labeled turns r into this thing. <laughs> <laughs> but wait, there's more. <laughs> so let's talk a bit more about R. This is called the reproduction rate because this model was originally developed in population ecology. You can think of it as the rate of replenishment for a population. So if you take the births and the deaths and you subtract the deaths from the births, that will tell you the replenishment rate. So if you have more births than you have deaths, your population is growing. Right, okay. If you have more deaths than births, your population is declining. Oh, I've right. heard about this from very trustworthy guys on the internet who are talking yeah, about... Yeah, 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 uh... because they think that this simplistic model works for humans. <laughs> Absolutely. But that is not the whole story, because what this function encodes is an idea of what is called carrying capacity. What the 1 minus x actually encodes is the fact that at some point you have used up more resources than you should, and you will die off in the next turn. All right. Sounding a bit Malthusian. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> right. uh, evil eugenicists have taken this idea to be basically that we should kill off a lot of poor brown people. Because, as I said, this is a simplistic model, and they go, oh, that must mean it's right. <laughs> <laughs> so the idea of carrying capacity isn't here explicitly as a term, but the relationship between x and 1 minus x encodes the idea that at some point you are overstressing your environment. You hit the, the the bean here. So reproductive rate is, and then x is your starting population? x0 is your starting population. x0 is your starting population. So what does it mean to go from x0.5 to 0.47? Okay, so here. So You're saying that if your reproductive rate is 1.9, then your population will stabilize it slightly below where you started? Well, I mean, if I started this at 0 0.4, it would climb to 0 0.47. Oh, okay. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. So this steady state is where it is at equilibrium with its environment based on that reproduction rate. Okay. Yeah. And so this Why didn't you start with this? This is way more interesting than just the numbers. Because I had to tell you how to get there. <laughs> I suppose I do understand it now, so maybe you've engaged in a little bit of pedagogy as a person who teaches for a living. Uh-huh. I teach this mathematics specifically. Maybe. All right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Fair enough, uh, I guess. Yeah. So if we look at these, R less than one, right? That means you have more deaths than you have births. So of course your population is going to die out. Mm -hmm. If you have R bigger than one, then you have more births than deaths up to carrying capacity. So you stabilize at a non-zero population, right? This is what these steady states are. Right, okay. That's not the whole story. Because you have this trade-off, because you have this idea of exhausting your, your available resources, you can actually see more complex behavior that we are about to look at. Because if you exceed your carrying capacity, you're then going to die out. Dana's making fish faces at the cat. I'm trying to keep him entertained by Could me. You just put him down on the floor. He's in the way. You put him up there. I did not put him anywhere. He <laughs> ensconced himself in my space. Could you I'm please? I'm just take... distracting him with fish faces. Could you just put him on the ground? He's happy there. Give him one more try. I'm just patting him. He's fine. Fine. So we have seen here, starting from 0 0.5, that you can have values decline 
to a steady state. If I had started these at smaller values, they would increase to the steady state. But this is not the whole story, and R is the defining parameter for the behavior we're about to see. So first, here we have R equals 0 0.8. Iterations means the turns, so you start at initial condition 0 0.5, and you can see that this population is declining. And it goes to 0 and it stays there. So in this case, we have a reproduction rate that is too low to have a surviving population. Here is r equal to 1, which does in fact decline to, de to 0 as well, just much, much slower, and is not long-term considered stable. Right. So how are you encoding the, like, the limiting factor of your resources? The function rxn1 minus xn, it's kind of in the relationship here. Right. Yeah, because this is, this is a penalty term for getting close to 1. Yeah, it just seems to me like the one is kind of arbitrary. Well, no, so there is another form of this which much more explicitly encodes a, a limiting factor. It's usually called L. This makes it easier to focus on the behavior in relation to L. Right, okay. Oh, okay, one one might be the available resource minus your population. Yeah. Which is the X. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Okay. Wouldn't, in most situations that exist like this, wouldn't there be some spikes as the population declines? Because ah, some results. Well, so would have for come... one thing, what I will say there is there is no real world population that actually behaves like this. Sure. The real world is too messy. Yeah, yeah. But we shall see. So next, this is r equal to one point five. So we can see here the declining behavior to that r minus one on r position, which is going to be zero point five on one point five or a third. So that should be three point three repeated there. So if your R is higher, you stabilize it closer to 1. Maybe. Maybe. Yes. And here, we have the emergence of a new behavior. This, we have that spike, and then decline, and then a bit of a spike, and then decline, and then steady out. So this is what we call a dampened oscillation. So if reproductive rate is how each actor that we're simulating here yeah. reproduces... And we're assuming that... It, you can think of it as proportional reproduction across the whole population instead. Right. Okay. So if I was thinking about people, you, you need to have a, a two to sustain yourself. No. No, no. You're thinking about it at, at a couple level. Yeah. You should think about it at a whole population level of this represents that with freely available resources, which we don't have because we have encoded a limiting factor... Each round, the population multiplies by two and a half. So without a limiting factor, your population more than doubles every turn. Okay. Yeah. So that's how you can think of R. But because we have the one minus Xn, we encode that limiting factor in there. Right. Because if I, if I imagine it more than doubling every turn, you know, 2.5 times every turn, I imagine that, you know, it, it's exponential. Yes, it is. Which means that you're encoding some pretty brutal die-offs to keep it Yes, that's what the 1 minus xn does. Right, yeah. And you can to actually see this starting to play out here, right? Yeah. You exceed your carrying capacity, so you die off. Then you're below your carrying capacity, so you reproduce a bit over, die off again, and then stabilize. Yeah, yeah. To that um, steady state. Mm -hmm. So this is what you see in dampened oscillation behavior. We increase R a little bit more, and we have more extreme dampened oscillation. Yeah, yeah. But again, you, you are still having one steady state. If we increase R again, we no longer have a single steady state. Right. Mm. So this is what we call a period two solution. Here we have two recurring values. Ladies, are you sick of period one? <laughs> <laughs> Try period two. I feel like you don't want more extreme than the last time. That, that seems... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> no, we've, we've iterated. It's, we've, we've shaved off some of the bugs. <laughs> so what you are seeing here is that in one season, uh, you go above your carrying capacity, then you have a die-off, then you can go back above, and a die-off and above, right? So you do see periodic behavior. Mm -hmm. This is a bit more like what you might expect to see in the real world, but it's not just related to your reproduction rate, because the available resources also changes. Yeah. And you have, like, predator-prey models, so you can get 
dynamical systems with kind of two of these interlinked, where one species is represents the prey of another and the food source of another. So if you have a boom cycle in one year for the prey species, you'll have a boom cycle the next year for the predator species. So interestingly, I'm now seeing what you mean by as they go higher, they don't necessarily go bigger. Do you get ones where the, the period is so large that you smack into zero and everyone's fucking dead? No. So this is where the real world runs into the mathematical structure that you're using to model it. Yeah. Because so long as you do not have zero in any of your R, X, N, or one minus X, N, you will never get zero as a number. Okay. Yeah. This is just a feature of the mathematical structure of the numbers between zero and one. Right. Okay. In the real world, you don't have fractions of an organism. Yes. So in the real world, you could have it collapse like that. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So that's radically different sort of behavior between this mathematical model and real populations. Inshallah, am I right? <laughs> <laughs> People used to talk about like tipping points, right? So there would be some like presumably like, uh, I mean, I'm sure they d- still do. In well, I mean, so schools, so yeah. a lot of that stuff now happens around climate change. Yeah. So we, we talk about we being like broadly scientists doing climate and climate change adjacent stuff. We talk about tipping points as... Like, thresholds for cascading failure. Yeah. Where something has been stressed to the point that you have a failure, but so much else has been relying on the thing that was being stressed that it starts to fail. Yeah. Yeah, so certainly they do exist. And you can see ecosystems where that has occurred. So um, a lot of this... If you look at what happens when you introduce a new species there can be cascading failures that result from that species either um, killing off a prey species by just consuming it too much and then dying off. Or in plants, what you tend to see is that an invasive species species comes in and colonizes a new area and the older forms die out. So a lot of weeds do this and introduced species do this. Yeah. Sometimes you get some sort of, you have a collapse and then a period of stabilization because, you know, life doesn't end when one species gets wiped out, right? Other things come on along and colonize those resources. But you could have collapsing ecosystems where that ecosystem just disappears and a new one replaces it over time. You can see a great documentary on this called The Wild Thornberries. (laughs) Uh, You can Uh, watch that and then every week there's a little lesson about stuff just like this. Yeah, yeah. And boy, are we going to see a lot of this shit in our lifetime. (laughs) I was thinking my d- my dad's theory that if we ever stop eating canola, canola will be a weed that fucking oh, it already farmers is. have to like destroy even on like the other normal crops that they have to grow, which are also introduced, you know? Like- canola already is a weed and farm escapees are a really big problem in a lot of places. Yeah. Let's go one step further. So we're going to increase R again. Now we have a period four solution. Okay, this is referring to the... The number of repeating values. Right. So we've got one, two, three, four. Yeah. yeah. But as you can see, again, different behavior. All we've done is change R. Ladies, are you sick of period two? (laughs) You can double your period. Theoretically, would this stabilize to the same average rate, I guess, over time? Or is it... No, no. So this is a genuine four repeating value scenario right you can run this for as many iterations as you want you will see the same four values over time right these are a genuinely different behavior based on our radically different behavior you have your single steady state you have two repeating values you have four repeating values and now this is what we call a chaotic solution right which means no repeating values we call this aperiodic so this Ladies, is the I- you s- sorry. Well, yeah, yeah, no periods at all. The ideal situation, if you ask me. <laughs> Chaotic solution has a slightly broader meaning than this, which is also sensitive. The dragon of chaos. To mat- uh, to initial conditions. Causes uh, sensitive to initial conditions. And we'll see what that means in a second. But I want to talk about the no repeating values or a periodic. The population dying out. It's sorry. This is very very literal. You're there doing are, my Jordan Peterson impression. I'm doing my best to ignore it. <laughs> a periodic means that you never see the same number twice. <sighs> because this is a deterministic system, as soon as you return to the same number, you get a cycle. The same way we saw like in the last bonus episode with that 421, 421. In this, it's a deterministic system. 
to get a genuine aperiodic system, you cannot see the same number twice. This exploits the fact that you have this 0-1 mathematical object as opposed to a real population. Because a real population does not behave in such a nice way. I gotta admit, this looks more, like, realistic than the, the flat line. Yes. But only in the sense that you don't expect a, a single repeating value in the real world because the real world is too noisy. Yeah, yeah. You can have a general trend in population behavior in the real world, which is not aperiodic and chaotic, really, but that's distinct to this simple system giving you this chaotic yeah, behavior. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to increase R one more time. So this is where you have R 3.9. These huge swings are a result of the fact that you have such a rapid reproduction. Yeah. So you can see that you can go from a low number to quite a high number to a low number to a high number. That's because you have really rapid reproduction rate as represented by the fact that R is 3.9, as opposed to 3.6 when you don't get such extreme variation. You really want to be born at one of the low points there. <laughs> so you just fuck a lot and eat a lot. <laughs> Look, all I'm saying is the boomers were definitely the pink. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Fuck. <laughs> I, I know. We're on the downswing, no! baby. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Declining living conditions. Hooray. That's even, uh, it's even worse to think about. Like, boomers had the best life possible, but at the same time. Yep. We're, we're going to we're gonna see the worsening living conditions. Absolutely. In fact, we're seeing them right now. We're seeing the start of the downfall. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what I mean by sensitivity to initial conditions is going to become clear here. We are starting this at x0 equal to 0 0.5, right? And we see this behavior as a result of that starting condition. On the next slide, I'm going to change x0, but I'm going to keep r the same. And we see different behavior. In this case, x0 equals to, I think it was 0 0.6. We see radically different long-term behavior for the same value of r, depending on the initial conditions. This is what it means to be sensitive to initial conditions. Right, okay. Whereas, Whereas the previous ones were not? Yes. So before... These ones with the period 4, period 2, and the steady state, these are not sensitive to initial conditions. These will always converge, regardless of where you start, to that same long-term behavior. Okay. As soon as you hit these aperiodic and chaotic solutions, that no longer applies. Right, okay. So this is a radically different behavior than what you saw for the smaller values of R. All right, I'll admit it. This is slightly interesting. I saw this in first year. This was my first real introduction to how you can see radically different behavior from just a simple parameter, a single parameter. Yeah. yeah. This is a discrete time system. You're looking at something that's ev evolving turn by turn. In a continuous time system, I think you need three parameters or more to see a chaotic solution or to see chaotic systems. I'm going to go one step further and show you this beautiful little thing here. <laughs> okay, on the x-axis we have R. This is your reproduction rate. I hate that the x is on the y-axis. I know, it sucks, right? So let's call it the horizontal Can axis. Can we just spin this? No. Because... <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'm sorry. I'm oh, sorry I asked. <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason it's this way, right? So here's your reproduction reproductive rate. Now, remember, we started seeing two solutions, right, at about two point, at three point something. What was it? Let's go, let's go have a look. 3.5, we had a period four solution. At 3.2, we had a period two solution. Okay. So let's go look at those, those numbers are. So we had 3.2. Yep. And then 3.5. The X values here, the, the vertical axis, is the repeating values. So at our 3.2, we had a repeating value here and a repeating value here. This is what I don't like about mathematics, right? Is that it starts out with someone, some nerd telling you about numbers and then they visualize it and there's weird eldritch lines that pass oh, yeah. through reality and you're like, oh, okay, that's fine. I'm just going to play video games and jerk off. <laughs> Fuck this. So your period one solutions for like 2.5 is here. Right? Yeah, yeah. A single repeating value. I follow. Okay. Period two solutions, period four solutions. Period eight solutions in here. Yeah, yeah, just wrote that slice. And then shortly after that, you go fucking sicko mode. So what we have here in the one to two to four to eight, there's 16, there's 32 and 64 and so on and so on and so on. This is called a period doubling cascade. Okay. Because in this 
for different values of r. It's all tucked up in here, actually, in this bit here. It does literally double the number of repeated values. Oh, is it fractaling? Yes. No! <laughs> Toys fractals! We're going to go Period look at... Period values cascade sounds like a level in Crash Bandicoot. Might be pointed out. A period doubling cascade. Also, at 3.83... Yeah, here. Is there like a 3? Yes, there is a 3. Oh. Oh, it gets worse. So, let's zoom in a bit. <laughs> I don't like that there, how there's a nexus of horror at 3.69. So, what the fuck? So the what you're eye seeing, of the storm. Yeah, yeah. So, what you are seeing here is you have stuff joining up. So what's happened here is you've had chaotic solutions in these gray bits, right? These are where you have genuinely aperiodic behavior. Yeah. And then you come to a point where the aperiodic behavior at some point meets up somewhere. And as soon as your reproduction rate causes something to meet up and you get a repeated value, you get a periodic solution again. I think I've mentioned on this podcast before that um, I think the best ever sort of metaphor for learning mathematics was a book I read called Vita Nostra, <laughs> which is about a Russian woman who goes to um, a school to learn sort of eldritch language. And she has to destroy her brain. Yeah, pretty much. In order to come to be able to comprehend. It's a very Russian way of learning. Bizarre. Right? It's like Russian Harry Potter in every sense mm. of the of the word. And I Although hate I want to be clear, I'm pretty sure they're Ukrainian authors. And you want to be a little careful with that these days. Okay, that's, yes. that's short. Sure, sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're talking East, Euro East European Harry Potter. <laughs> yes. And I hate that when you've got these models that you, by your own term, are aperiodic and chaotic. Yeah, when you look at them large enough, you can see these horrible swooping, like, eldritch I locuses. Horrible. I think they're quite beautiful, but, you know. No, they, think they are, but, like, <laughs> and then it goes and it all suddenly evens out into three and stays that way for a significant period of time. And then you have more bifurcation. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. after you've hit this period three solution, you have another period doubling cascade. I just find it interesting that this is chaotic, and yet when viewed... In aggregate, there is indeed something we can identify as... Structure, yes. As structure, even though it's... Chaotic. This happens in a lot of maths. Yeah, no, it's, it's... it's it's Yeah. So, another book, to mention another book. There's a book as a 40K novel, Warhammer 40,000. Oh, no. There's a Gaunt's Ghost novel, and there's a very fun thing where they come across a warehouse that's run by people who are worshippers of chaos, worshippers of, you know, the, the, the crawling entropic malevolent madness that's that below beneath the skin of reality and inside of it there are a whole bunch of uh, machines that are just little motors that drive drums and there's huge drums that beat very slowly and there's really tiny ones that are going like hundreds of times a second and there's a moment where for one second all of the drums sync up for exactly one beat <laughs> <laughs> yes because uh, because it's chaos. When this happens, everyone's head fucking explodes, <laughs> and it's it's very cool. And I'm just that bit there. I'm pointing viewer at the screen. This bit? No, no, no. Further left. This the bit. horrible locus of all evil. Oh, this bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah right. At three point six. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so six seven or whatever. Yeah, that's the bit where everyone's head explodes. <laughs> <laughs> That is on an eight-pointed star. It's oh, that, like... that reminds me of a punk song I used to know that went that had a line. Uh, it's ten. It's ten. That's fine. Because our nihilism <laughs> is the terrorist wing of youthful apathy. That's the same thing, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. <sighs> <laughs> and it, it is beautiful, but I don't look any time a handful of numbers start to behave like starts to resolve into beautiful swooping like. Where it starts to look like like a cross section of a tornado. <laughs> yeah, I don't like this. This is why maths. This is why you have to bully mathematicians. You can't <laughs> let them. You can fucking try. You can't let them get too advanced. <laughs> yeah, if we get too powerful, this shit starts to happen. Yeah, I know, right? There is a uh, series which I'm sure I've mentioned on the show before called the Laundry Files, where magic is a branch of maths. And I think that's probably the most realistic representation. Yeah, of course it yeah. is. Well, in the same way that I think that. Like programming is a modern form of, of magic, you know. You, yeah, absolutely. You you become programming like maths is applied logic, precisely. And but Except those motherfuckers do it on electric rocks, which is weird. Yeah, they're they're, they're more shamanistic. <laughs> I mean, look, we do it on electric meat; they do it on electric rocks. Mm. So you know, which is worse. well, honestly, if you want to go like fully deep into it, you could argue that like 
all of this shit is just theology for a modern era. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I do think that Dean, in his role as tech support for software, was functionally a priest. Yeah, no, I could I could really go into this at length, but uh, yeah, but I am 100% with you there. I have... I've got some rants on this. Yeah. <laughs> so I will also point out that we have a period five solution going through here. I noticed. It was the three to be so dramatic, so deep. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. It, it, well, what's particularly noticeable is how long that stretch yeah, lasts yeah. for, yeah. And there's also other period fives a little so further So there's along. a period one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four. So every natural number, so every counting number is in here somewhere. Wow, okay. Yeah, every single one. So there's a period 5,000 in there. I mean, obviously, that's probably in one there. Already. Yeah, you, we just can't see it at this resolution, but yeah, yeah. it is there. I mean, the the powers of 2, so 2, 4, 8, 16, and so on, they come from the period doubling cascade, the initial one, right, that comes out of here. All of the powers of 2 are in there. You really can see, as you're looking at this, how, like early mathematicians did get into some fucking esoterica. They weren't wrong. <laughs> yeah, no. <it's... laughs> I mean, like, a lot of people in maths are there for religious purposes, let's say. Yeah, you know, I mean, absolutely. You look, you look at the sacred geometry in Islamic tradition, it is there because they see mathematics as part of the language of God. Go, and I get it. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> go, go ahead, one more slide. This yeah. one. Biblically accurate angel. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, this is cool. I admit it. Thank you for showing me this. Got him. Woo! All right. Air horns. Bow, 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 bow. All right, listener, you got your fucking money's worth. I hope so. All right. But yeah, that, that is the content for this week. But I, this is one of my favorite mathematical objects, not least because it's one of the first I encountered. And when I saw this, I went, well, fuck, okay. Yeah. <laughs> you almost want, like, a framed thing of that. It's really cool. I would be very, very tempted, actually. Maybe if we get a place. I've been meaning to get a gift for you, so I'm just saying don't get it for yourself. <laughs> okay. This so. is like uh, competing doctrines. I've always wanted the French Revolutionary Calendar. I think it's the dorkiest project <laughs> ever embarked on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, when's your birthday? <laughs> Mine. See you, mate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Don't say it on the podcast. No. We'll see you Mine's yeah. a listener of dogs myself i'm gonna bleep that out <laughs> i'm gonna bleep that out as well no! <laughs> see you later <laughs>